Good evening and welcome to this monthly meeting of our Edgar Casey on presentation. This time I'll be talking about Eckhart Tolle. Now it's not that Edgar Casey actually gave readings on Eckhart Tolle. They were not contemporary since Casey died in 1945. But what I am doing is to take a very popular person, Eckhart Tolle, and the, and the uh, things that he has come up with in his books, The Power of Now uh, and <clears throat> New Earth, and I'm going to go ahead and use what I've been able to get out of those books as a comparison, to compare and contrast it against the Edgar Casey readings, largely finding the points of agreement between them, and be able to probably give you an exposure to Tolly if you've never heard of him before, because I'm really impressed with this guy, truly. There are so many things that, uh, that are good about what he has to say and an excellent way of presenting it. The disclaimer looks like it normally does, except that I am saying that the main source of information for this presentation comes from the Casey readings themselves and from Eckhart Tolle books and other sources on the internet. So I have YouTube stuff in here and, and uh, you know, images that you pull off of the internet. And again, this is all subject to personal interpretation, so it's not like I'm speaking on behalf certainly of Eckhart Tolle, I am not. And uh, with the Casey readings, even though I'm much more uh, familiar with those. These are, again, my own interpretations of them. The majority of the information for what you will be seeing tonight comes from this particular book, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. Now, uh, you're actually going to see page numbers in there as far as if you have this book and you want to go find those quotes yourself, the page numbers are at are in the quotes. If I had to condense it, because what he said took two or three paragraphs to say and I condensed it, I actually have paraphrased at the end of the quote, so you can see when it's been altered according to my needs on there. And of course the other side of that, I don't know if you remember back to the days when they had CD-ROMs and DVDs, but uh, that's uh, a picture of the old DVD that has the entire set of the Edgar Casey readings on it, so uh, that's the other side as far as my background and being able to give you the opinions here. Uh, the reason that I go ahead and have the focus mainly, I, I, you have to, you know, the tail wagging the dog kind of thing, it would be very difficult for me to go ahead and pull a Casey quote and then try to go to the plethora of, of information available from Tolly and try to make it fit to that. So I did it the other way around. I'm taking mainly, except for the very beginning here, I'm mainly I'm taking uh, uh, Eckhart Tolle quotes, and then I will just be verbally telling you what the Casey perspective is on it. So, we're going to start because there's a lot. This is get, I've got the fire hose out now, and you're getting ready to take a drink because this is a lot of information. All right, what do the Casey readings say about God? First and foremost is that little mathematical formula up there that has absolutely no numbers in it. God equals love equals law. That's a uh, ongoing quote in the Casey readings, recognizing that God, the I am that I am, can also be defined as love. And certainly within three dimensions here, that it comes out as law. What we see that around would be the, like the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, laws of mathematics and music. All of those things are the way that God manifests within three dimensions. So as it uh, says up there, before there was anything else, there was God. That pure consciousness, God, is complete as it is. But the I am that I am desired companionship. We were created perfect to be God's companions and co-creators throughout eternity. Again, this is the Edgar Casey's perspective of the readings as far as who God is, and what our relationship is to him. So we are the children of God created in his perfect image to be companions and co-creators throughout eternity. And down here, I'm taking this from A Search for God, life is the creative force in action and is the expression of love. Okay, so that came from A Search for God books. If you work with uh, that, uh, that material in our Casey study groups, you would be able to look that up on page 123. Now, Eckhart Tolle says that our consciousnesses, uh, there is an evolution through form that is necessary. In other words, that what we are going through here on the earth was a necessary evolution for our consciousness. It's almost like you have to take U.S. history in eighth grade, 
you know, in order to be able to get a high school diploma. Well, the, it is my understanding of this is that we must go through these physical bodies and live as we are doing right now as a necessary step to advance our consciousness. So the essential purpose of the universe, the entire universe's essential purpose is to support our emergent, uh, emerging intelligence. All right, so as we are growing in intelligence, this whole universe, its entire purpose is set so that we will be able to constantly grow and become greater and greater. Be all you can be, as the army says. So our growing awareness of who we are and how the universe becomes aware of itself is exactly why we are here. All right, our growing awareness of who we are is how the universe becomes aware of itself. Interesting concept from the, uh, from the Tolley perspective. So what I draw out of all this is that the sum total of all creation equals God to Eckhart Tolle. And I'm going to actually give you a video clip from the Oprah Winfrey show here in a little bit in which uh, Oprah and he go back and forth over what is uh, the definition of God, which is actually the definition of life as far as how it goes back and forth. So at the universe, it, this is the interesting thing. If you go with what, uh, the sum total of all creation equals God, according to Eckhart Tolle, what I draw from that is that if the universe and all of us souls were to go away, God disappears at the same time. In other words, we are God collectively. And that if we weren't here, then God wouldn't be here. Casey, on the other hand, in the case that while we live and move and have our very being within the mind of God, if the manifest universe went away and all the souls went away, there would still be God. All right, so there's an there's a interesting uh, difference in there that I'll explore deeper here in a minute. One of the things that uh, you did after the New Earth seminars, you wrote a book called Oneness with All Life a companion to a new earth, which says many of the things that are in new earth, but it's not, uh, it's not like a, a summarized version of new earth. Yeah. Okay. Now this is what I loved from Oneness with All Life. This is also right next to my bed, my signed copy from you. You say, through the present moment, you have access to the power of life itself, the power of life itself, that which has traditionally been called God, which I thought is such a beautiful definition of God the power of life itself. As soon as you turn away from it, God ceases to be a reality in your life. And all you're left with is the mental concept of God, the mental concept, which is what a lot of people talk about, yes. the mental concept of God, their belief in God. And what you go on to say is, which some people believe in and others deny, even belief in God is only a poor substitute for the living reality of God manifesting every moment of your life. Yes. I think that is such a beautiful offering for yes. Super Soul Sunday. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's stepping from belief, which is fine, going to the deeper level where belief becomes an actual realization or a knowing. And that can start with a simple thing like, and anybody can verify that in their own experience. How? When you take your attention into the present moment, which implies, of course, a certain alertness arises. Yes, yes. Uh, which is different from thinking. Thinking, compared to that, is almost like a kind of dreamlike state. You're up here, not, yes. not present here. So a certain alertness arises. You become more conscious of what surrounds you. But also, strangely, it's hard to talk about it, but I will, of an, an underlying, a sense of presence that is both within and without. Yes. A presence. We could call that it a divine presence. Yes. Uh, there is something... And that presence, what everybody needs to know, is the, the presence that you feel when you're able to silence your mind. Silence your mind. And be aware of the silence that's in your mind you are that awareness yes be, disguised as a person yes and when you become conscious of the gap between two thoughts for example or even now sometimes i even recommend to people that they they hold the, their hands like this and they create this let's say past is there future is there you you let them go now you bring your attention to just the present 
it can be a little reminder the, to help you be, hold that sense of presence. And to recognize present that the past is awareness. here and the future is here yes. and that the only moment that matters the, is right now. The only thing you ever have, have is now. All right. <clears throat> One of the reasons I let the clip run beyond the definition of God is that whole idea of the past, present, and future is echoed through almost every concept that, uh, that Tolley has when he's trying to get us to become present and aware. I wanted to give a, a this actually doesn't even come from his website, <clears throat> but it does give you an idea of what his definition of the ego is. All right, so let's say that the ego almost becomes a person. Uh, I would like to say, it, I, I would equate what the ego winds up being is not like a soul, but the ego winds up being like um, uh, a virus. You know, a computer hacker would go out there and create a virus that just starts, it's programmed to act in a certain way. And when it gets this stimulus, it has to react. I said, I've been, in, you know, installed on the hard drive and now I react this way. Or the internet has opened up and so now I'm going to go through the internet wires and go find people. Well, these are the ways that the ego winds up identifying itself. And you can read, I don't know if you can read them from all back there. Wanting drama, feeling superior, complaining or resentment, being right and making others wrong, defending an illusion, Reactivity, uh, react, uh, reactivity as in reactive and gre grievances and making truths. All right, so if you look at this, it's kind of like this shell or chrysalis around this thing, this virus, if you will, called the ego. And it's the thing that we create every time we make selfish choices. Any choices that we make that are in harmony with the universe, I won't say God because that's not how he describes it, but every time we make choices that are in harmony with the universe, then that has nothing to do with the ego. In fact, it starts to detract from the ego to the point where it would disappear altogether. It's almost like a virus side, if you will, that would uh, make the virus go away. So this is another concept as far as, you know, this ego is not an actual person, but think of it as being a shell that we each build around ourselves through the uh, selfish or negative thoughts that we put together. So, <clears throat> when you see this ET, that doesn't stand for extraterrestrial, it is Eckhart Tolle. So it's from Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth on page 8. You cannot fight against the ego and win, just as you cannot fight against darkness. The light of consciousness is all that is necessary. You are that light. You know, one thing that Casey does all of the time, and that is, well, did, <laughs> is in the Casey readings you will find numerous Bible quotes. I, I'm not sure he went through any metaphysical uh, a kind of reading, about 30% of them fall into that category, that he didn't quote the Bible. It just turned out that way, and he was so, uh, you know, he was raised as disciples of Christ, uh, from the Church of Christ, and so he loved the King James Version, and a lot of his syntax comes from that. So when you, if I were to give you the statement that comes out of his uh, readings, and it's it, a direct quote and paraphrased, get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, what does that mean exactly? It's not just sitting there going, uh, uh, Satan, let's arm wrestle. Uh, Satan, let's go two out of three in a boxing match. Those are fights. You cannot fight against evil like that, if you will, and win. What you wind up doing is just saying, I don't need you. Get back there and I can go on to my purpose. <clears throat> the best thing that I can see as far as making this... Uh, if I were to start looking for darkness, and I use a flashlight to do it, how successful would I be? <laughs> Everywhere I'd point the flashlight trying to find darkness, it would disappear, right? That's the best concept. I can just throw that out there and make your mind do that for a second so you understand you are that light. Once you have the correct mental attitudes and emotions that Casey talks about, in his case, he's just saying the light of consciousness. So he defines it as consciousness. Casey is always talking about having a loving approach to life with the correct attitudes and emotions all the way through. So the darkness simply moves out of our way. On page 9, interesting way of putting this. To sin means to miss the point of human consciousness. 
To sin means to miss the point of human consciousness. How, uh, here's an interesting, uh, you know, analogy. What if you were sitting there with a, with a uh, chessboard and you started moving the pieces not according to the rules? Uh, you know, people would look at you and go, well, that's dumb. Well, so are selfish choices that we make. Imagine every selfish choice we make is nothing more than moving chess pieces around a board incorrectly. And it gives us an entirely different perspective as far as what a sin truly is. Is a sin this, you know, evil thing that has a, you know, long horns, red skin, and a pitchfork, and a pointed tail? That's one way we can sit there and think of sin and selfishness, or we can think of it in the way that the, uh, that the Casey uh, readings talk about it, is to say that it is just God's power misapplied. Misapplied. Is the, is the key term there, and this is to miss the point of human consciousness. Tolley's, almost all of his vocabulary has to do with a state of being rather than a state of action. If you're acting, you're, you know, you're, you're not sitting in the stillness and getting in touch with the divine within. And so Casey is, is always talking about, okay, that's a good thing. He's so big on meditation that Tolley's got nothing on him with that. But then he wants you to go out and, as he said over and over again, work like thunder. He always said that to people who go, well, what do I do next? You told me about all these things, but what do I do now? Work like thunder. He'd say that constantly in trying to get people saying, I've told you what needs to be done. Now go ahead and start manifesting it in three dimensions. Okay, so uh, we're either perfect or we're not for in both cases. And there's no real good measure of sin. I know this is going to throw things off, but to get a parking ticket or cheat on your taxes or murder are actually all sins. Is one worse than another? No. <laughs> I know that sounds awful, but let me tell you the way to be able to measure something like that. You are either one with that perfect standard of God or you're not. And the way to be able to tell the difference between a parking ticket, cheating on your taxes, and murder is which one makes it harder for you to go ahead and get back on the path back to God. All right? It may be easier to not cheat on your taxes anymore than if you are a drug addict and you are, you know, or, or hooked on drinking or one of the other addictions that are out there or you kill people like a serial killer. I mean, you see what I'm getting at? Those are harder to be able to overcome than to, <clears throat> okay, I really shouldn't cheat on my taxes anymore and then go forth and sin no more. So these are... in perfect agreement in my mind. I think uh, uh, Tolley's concept agrees that we're either, uh, you know, we understand who and what we are or we don't. That would be to sin or not to sin. And whether we see ourselves as trapped inside of the ego, you remember that shell I was talking about, or as Casey would talk about it being simply confused regarding our true divine nature, we end up in the same place. And here we are gathered here this evening. All right, so this is just, this isn't, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, A New Earth. This is a different quote from Eckhart Tolle. So feeling will get you closer to the truth of who you are than thinking. I cannot tell you anything that deep within you, you don't know already. When you have reached a certain stage of interconnectedness, you recognize the truth when you hear it. If you haven't reached that stage yet, the practice of body awareness will bring about the deepening that is necessary. Uh, Tolly is, is really talking about, from a Casey perspective, is talking about meditation. Because in meditation, you set aside all the cares and concerns of the day and focus on the divine within each one of us. All right? And when we get in connect, uh, when we have that connectedness with the divine within that Tolly is talking about without saying you're trying to connect with, uh, you know, with this first cause, the I am that I am God, that's how Casey would describe it. The divine within is that peace within each of us that is God. But Tolly is saying you're getting in touch with the truth, with the power that is life. All right. You do not become good by trying to become good, but by finding the goodness that is already within you and allowing that goodness to emerge. There's so many things that from a prosperity standpoint, have you ever heard that one that says, you know, banks won't lend you money unless you don't really need it? 
I, I, I see that as being real similar to what I'm seeing up here. The best way to become good is just by allowing the good that's already in you to emerge. And how do you do that? By getting away from this ego, by this shell, this, I'm going to show you a video in a bit of a chrysalis, like with a butterfly uh, emerging from the chrysalis, that allows that perfect creation that's inside of this ego shell to be able to emerge. So, the readings say that we were created perfect. All right, that's, uh, that's one of the differences since Tolley, Tolley does not have a problem with what Casey's saying. He simply doesn't teach it. All right, I don't think Kit Tolley would say, well, Edgar Casey's wrong. I think he would say, well, how do we really know? And Edgar Casey could be right. I think it's really important. If it sounds like I'm saying that these two don't agree with each other, I think that's a much better way of, of uh, putting Tolley's perspective, saying nobody knows what the answer is to that, and you can still go forward. We have the tools that we need to be able to draw the goodness out of ourselves, whether you believe with um, more of a Buddhist perspective or what Casey's talking about in this case. So, uh, it, it, you know, this really makes it, for me at least, easy to understand why we already know what good is within us because we were created that way. I, uh, totally doesn't talk about us having a creation, uh, uh, per se, from a God that has an intelligence and uh, purpose out there, but it all comes down to the same thing. Here we are gathered here today. So, your love is not outside. It is deep within you. You can never lose it, and it cannot leave you. That one threw me more than just about anything else that I had seen out there. It's the first time that I've ever heard love being defined as being within rather than being omnipresent. You get what I'm saying with that? I, I, I always feel like, you know, each one of us, if God is love, then everything is love. And, and the focus of what uh, this quote is talking about is that love is a state of being that is within us and not outside of us. So I, that, uh, you know, what I'm going to assume here is that the difference is semantics rather than totally putting a limit on the power of love or the omnipresence of love. But I did want to take, you know, who is God? And I'm going to talk about reincarnation, uh, you know, in a bit. And it's certainly uh, about the power of love here to be able to make sure those main points are covered. When we believe that we are right and others are wrong, we are defining our own identity through our enemies. Isn't that interesting? If you're going to use what you think is something that's wrong or incorrect to try to define you as being right, isn't that a flawed premise to begin with? I really like the way he put that. I mean, it makes it very clear. So, Casey on this, uh, on this side of the fence is talking about the, uh, the perfect ideal. If you're familiar with that, <clears throat> you, the perfect ideal is that there is a perfect way to do all of the um, fruits of the Spirit. If you're going to have perfect patience, if you're going to have perfect love, perfect fellowship, perfect long-suffering, all of the things that are mentioned in the Bible as, uh, as fruits of the Spirit, there is a perfect ideal of service, and et cetera, to be able to attain to. And when we compare ourselves to others in terms of trying to measure our spiritual progress in the world, we're using the wrong standard and values. I, uh, many of you that have been in study groups with me have heard me joke about the idea that setting a goal of being allowed to sit at the cool table in an insane asylum is like trying to go ahead and evaluate how well we're doing compared to our neighbors. All right, so it, it, if all your standard is is trying to sit at the cool table in the insane asylum, congratulations, here we are. And, uh, you know, you can, you can probably attain that fairly easily. But we really knew, do need to set our ultimate goals at the very highest level of the ideal, is what Casey is talking about. And there's no doubt that that's what Tolly is saying up here, too. When we wind up judging ourselves in comparison to others, we're using them to define who we are, and that's the wrong direction to go. They realize that how spiritual you are has nothing to do with what you believe, but everything to do with your state of consciousness. Uh, the Casey readings are even a little more specific with this. They say the best measurement of our spiritual progress on this earth is our level of patience. So, 
the more patient, I mean, you know what? You can sit there and run into the people who are the most pious out there, and certainly we've seen, you know, lots of televangelists who came tumbling down after a while that <clears throat> they certainly appeared to be pious, but how much patience did they have? And, and you know, all that goes along with that was a question. But uh, another humorous line that goes along with this is that, you know, if you're sitting in church, every week that doesn't prove that we're a spiritual person any more than sitting in a garage every week proves that we're a car <laughs> all right it doesn't matter that we show up and we look bright-eyed and attentive it's the level of patience according to casey and of course eckhart tolle's echoing the same here it has nothing to do with what you believe show up to do exactly it's what's in your state of consciousness that really defines us Power over others is weakness disguised as strength. Now, I would actually, it, I have a feeling because I didn't pull this out of the book myself, I think that it would be fair to say that Tolley would agree with this, that I would like to add the, I, uh, add the word desiring. So the Edgar Casey readings would say, desiring to have power over others is weakness disguised as strength. Because I would have to say that Jesus is, you know, Lord. Jesus does have the power, you know, over he, Jesus is able to work with us to be able to heal, you know, make the lame walk and the blind see, etc. So it's not a question of whether or not you can have power. It's do I want this power to be able to lord it over you? I think that's the problem that we're talking about. And it really does uh, tend to define what happens with us and you go if uh, <laughs> having all power is all corrupting right I don't even remember who had that quote was that Karl Marx but uh, the idea that if you are seeking power for its own sake then you wind up actually showing your weakness and it's really not a strength as it appears to be what is evil complete identification with form physical form thought forms emotional forms all right, so in determining what is truly evil in this world, I think what he's talking about right here is very much what happens with, um, with Casey. Casey describes that we have the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. Those three realms are all a part of each one of us. So that in the physical body, if we meditate, we can get in touch with the mental, which is a higher realm of existence, and into the infinite, if you will, on the spiritual realm, where we are all connected, kind of like fingers of a hand. Here's the, uh, if you want to talk about the fingers as being the body, the hand winds up being the mind, and the rest of the, you know, our existence is this entire body in which we are connected and live and move and have our very being. I think these three things, physical, thought, emotional forms, are saying when we wind up thinking that we are the bodies that we are living in day by day, we forget the spiritual nature of who we are, and then we start to identify with what's, uh, you know, what the world says is important out there. Let's make sure we have you know, the 2.5 kids, cars, and house, and job, and all the rest of that stuff that goes, with it, goes along with it. So the, uh, you know, the outcome is that we wind up believing that our, our physical bodies are exactly who we are, and then it starts to have us identifying with the ego sphere of death. Remember, we're eternal beings. We can't die, and yet most of us have a fear of death. The ego should have a real fear of death because it's had a beginning and it's going to have an end. So this ego, this malware, this virus, you know, that's sitting inside of our computers, if you will, is has every reason to be afraid because it definitely is going to find its demise at one point and here we are the eternal beings being afraid of having some uh, some change that we call death we have nothing to fear in, in and of ourselves so it's just another way of of uh, saying the same thing between Tolley and Casey in terms of what is evil the recognition of illusion is also its ending its survival depends on your mistaking it for reality. And then in a, six pages later, it says the egoic mind is completely conditioned by the past. So what we're saying is this chrysalis that comes around us is completely hardened. That shell that we, uh, 
create of our selfish thoughts is completely hardened because of the past decisions that we have made that have gone to add to it. Obviously, the loving decisions that we have made just slide right off of the thing and they go on their own merry way. But birds of a feather flock together. Our selfish thoughts come together and start to make that a thicker and thicker shell around us, creating the ego and making it more formidable as the virus that it is. Now, this is a place where the KC readings tend to go different from where Tol uh, Tolly is, but you'll understand why the difference because of the fundamental belief in God. KC says that it is as important to know where we have been as it is to know where we are going. It is as important to know where we have been as it is to know where we, where we are going. Now, you know, that, that just takes everything where he said, well, let's take the past and throw that away and the future and throw that away and let's live in the present moment. Casey's very much in favor of that. He says, you do need to live in the present moment. But those who, you have the other quote, this is not Casey, but the other quote that says, those who do not study and remember history are doomed to repeat it. So you really do need to learn from the past mistakes that have happened out there and plan better for the future. I think, once again, this is one of those semantics things that if you were to actually have Eckhart Tolle sitting right here, he, you know, you would be able to find a, vo a common vocabulary in which both of those points uh, wind up being made. So the, uh, the idea certainly is, uh, is in harmony as far as between the two, that it's selfish choices we've made since whenever you go back in history that have distorted our perception of our true nature as truly spiritual beings. We cannot find ourselves through identifying with things. Ego identification with things creates an attachment to them. That attachment always desires that we acquire more things rather than identifying with our spiritual nature. This is an interesting point because uh, it, it'll come up again when, uh, when I come into a, a totally talking about prosperity. But what if you're this miserly person that goes out there and, you know, just gathers all the wealth that you can imagine. And he's got these, you know, mansions and yachts and he's got all this money in the bank and then he dies. What does he got? <laughs> I mean, what did you just do all that for? It makes absolutely no sense if you understand that the soul survives the body and you're going, if I wasn't doing all the right things when I had all that stuff, it's all going to be taken away from me in the end anyway. So really, I ought to have my mind working along the, and Casey would say the right ideal, and Tolle would say that you shouldn't have ego identification with things. In both cases, they're saying all of your decisions should be made spiritually rather than trying to identify with form, three dimensions, things, whatever uh, wording you prefer on that. So, you know, society is wise in its, uh, in its own deceit. You know, it, it doesn't understand that as you're saying, you know, all of the if uh, somebody hits you, you know, you hit them back. You know, that, that's certainly the way the, the government is out there. Well, they attacked us, so now we have to go to war with them, and et cetera, et cetera. You can see how there may be a different spiritual answer than, like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, than to fight fire with fire. And I think both Tolly and uh, Casey agree with that. How do you know? that what you are going through today is for your greatest spiritual growth? Because this is the experience that you are having at the moment. Life is always trying to help you evolve your consciousness. I, it, I really like this because it's one of the, the things that Tolly says that is so clear that the universe is friendly. That's one of my basic you know, beliefs. The universe is friendly. You can count on the idea that the entire universe is working with us to be able to put us back on the path of being one with God. So uh, the universal laws, you know, they always draw the things to us that prevent the next steps on the path back to the Father. It's an interesting way of looking at, uh, at karma and luck. You know, when you're going, well, they just got lucky. They got this contract or, you know, that particular thing happened or you happen to be in the right place at the right time or, you know, he made that invention happen out there. Casey defines... Luck is 99% karma and 1% chance. Interesting way to be able to look 
at what occurs in life. Because when so, you say somebody is lucky and it's 99% karma, 1% chance, it means all of my past decisions have culminated into this being the next best, uh, best step on the path for me. And so it's not lucky at all. It is, uh, this is, it, who was it? Was it a group or I don't think they ever found out. In South Carolina, the one $1.6 billion, you know, in, uh, in the lottery on there. It, that could have been wealth or it could be the worst thing that ever happened to him if you hear some of those lottery stories, right? <laughs> so most of them wind up bankrupt after, uh, you know, a number of years not knowing how to handle it. But it could also be to their greatest good. But no matter what, it's always trying to show you the next steps back to the Father. So if you understand the difference between just having luck and having 99% karma. Now that 1% chance is interesting because it does mean that there is some randomness to what goes on. Not that, as Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle shall in no case pass from the law until all be fulfilled, right? Yeah, that thing out there, it says, that doesn't sound like there's a 1% chance unless you understand that reincarnation exists. In other words, you will have a cause and an effect. Now, will it happen this day, this day, that day, that week, that lifetime? That's the 1% chance, where the randomness can wind up changing the time, but since there is no time and space anyway, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a random thing to, to uh, worry about. The ego isn't wrong. It's just unconscious. When you detect egoic behavior in yourself, simply smile or laugh and release it. Now, you heard me talk before about get thee behind me, Satan, rather than try to, you know, arm wrestle uh, Lucifer or whatever, um, or to get all upset about the temptation or feeling shame and guilt when you don't actually live up to what you believe. But the idea from the Casey readings is it doesn't matter what we've done in the past. Simply go forth and sin no more. God's not trying to, you know, to hold our feet to the fire or anything like that. We just need to learn our lessons, go forth and sin no more, and the rest of that stuff is a moot point from that time on. This is absolutely what I think I see Eckhart Tolle saying up here, that once you see that kind of behavior in yourself, and you go, boy, I allowed the ego to go ahead and start making these reactive decisions for me instead of me thinking it through from a spiritual perspective and making a better choice. No ego can last for long without the need for more. Therefore, wanting keeps the ego alive much more than having. How do you let go of attachment to things? Don't even try. It's impossible. Attachment to things drops away by itself when you no longer seek to find yourself in them. I think this is very true of just about any addiction out there. If you sit there and go, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, I'm not, that's the worst way you can go about it. What do you, how, how do they tell you to do it in the, in the rehab places and all that? And what I understand, what they do is they have you get busy doing other things. Not only to improve yourself, but to be of service to other people, to take the focus off of the, what I'm not going to do anymore. All right, so you put the focus out there and try to be of service to other folks, and you don't even have to try because what's going to happen is, is it'll just melt away as far as your attachment to those things. I think it's always interesting to go, you ever hear the, you know, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. Because if you keep pursuing something, and this comes up in the KC readings on a number of occasions in which uh, I remember one guy in particular had, he was a Roman soldier and he'd seen this princess and, you know, a few thousand years before and it just said, if only I could have her as my wife. Well, that incarnation he did. And he was not pleased. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I won't use the terrible language in it, but uh, there's a great bumper sticker that says, no matter how beautiful she is, somewhere someone is really tired of her stuff. <laughs> it let you know, well, just whatever you want to measure people by, there's always a different measurement when you're trying to look at it from a, a spiritual uh, perspective. If you don't equate the body with who you are, when beauty fades, vigor diminishes, or the body becomes incapacitated, this will not affect your sense of worth or identity in any way. In fact, as the body begins to weaken, the formless dimension, the light of consciousness, can shine more easily through the fading form. 
it's kind of a shame that our, um, especially as I'm getting older and I think I have more to share with the world, that, <laughs> that this is when we all get ignored. <laughs> as being, you know, out of touch and you don't understand and, you know, it's so much different now than it was back when you grew up playing with a beanbag instead of uh, video games or whatever. <laughs> so the, uh, what happens is, is that it, a lot of religions or, or metaphysical ways of looking at life teach that we're trying to be as, as good as we can so that we can move toward living a happier life someplace else. And I think totally kind of touches on this here in a little bit as far as saying where can we find happiness even if our beauty is faded the vigor diminishes the body becomes incapacitated you can still find it right here on earth if you don't identify with form if you don't let the ego take over and say this is what my values are and you go how patient am I? Remember that one. Measure your spiritual development by patience. How patient am I? How much am I a service to my neighbor, etc.? And when you do that, then you wind up saying, I can more easily shine through the fading form of the body as long as I look at it like that. The, uh, uh, one of the things that the Casey readings say why we're here, once we realize that we can experience heaven wherever we are, then we, don't, uh, then we don't have to go anywhere, do we? I mean, all the other religions are talking about if you're good, if you follow these rules, if you, uh, you know, follow these tenets of, of our church, then when you die, you'll be able to go off to this wonderful place called heaven. Casey is so clear, and I think to totally touches on it here too, that if you can't find heaven right where you are right now, then you've missed the entire point of consciousness all over again. That in and of itself would be a sin. Do not try to let go of a grievance. So we're talking about how do you forgive somebody, right? Do not try to let go of the grievance. Trying to let go to forgive does not work. Forgiveness happens naturally when you see that it has no purpose other than to strengthen a false sense of self to keep the ego in place. By not reacting to the ego, you will often be able to bring out the sanity and others. I'm pretty sure that parents, I'm not one, but I have certainly had uh, enough conversations about what it takes to raise kids and to be able to not react to the kids, you know, frenzy and the, how frantic they are about things and you meet them with calmness, meet them with patience, meet them with forgiveness, at the same time is that that's one way to be able to calm a child down if they're just getting all caught up in the in the ego if you will or, or the excitement of whatever is uh, uh, distracting them at that time now the KC readings uh, tend to talk about this in terms of well I mean the quote is act as if it were not and that's what we should do when it comes to improving our ill feelings towards others in other words you go out there and if we, it's almost behavior modification, that if you act as if it is not, then you have this mutual thing of virtue and understanding. If you act virtuous, the understanding naturally comes to you. If you learn and read all sorts of books, then you learn a better way to make choices and to live. So those two things are actually in concert with each other. That if we act as if it is not, then all of a sudden the forgiveness, as Tolley is talking about, occurs or happens naturally when you're out there instead of I forgive you I forgive you you know if you just keep doing it with attitude it's gonna be like you know those prayer wheels that they have in the, <laughs> in the Far East and you're going boy that's doing a lot of good don't you think <laughs> so you wind up making sure that if you act as if it is not it's not like you're saying I forgive you you go if you're genuinely being nice to that person then you are calling or drawing the best out of them in return to you as I said, you can do that with people of any age, certainly with children. Being in touch with truth is your natural state, not some miraculous achievement. There is nothing that strengthens the ego more than celebrating a battle or conflict where you were proven right. Making others wrong gives a greater sense of who we are. Now, I talked about this earlier as far as defining ourselves through the things that we are saying that the other person is wrong about. Now, it's, uh, I think, probably the ultimate example 
of this is when Jesus got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and then he was tortured in the crown of thorns and humiliated in front of everyone. Then he had to go carry the cross up to Mount Calvary and then they nailed him to it and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do we think he said that through gritted teeth or that he actually meant it? That is the difference. I mean, you might be able to go out there and have one of us be able to, uh, you know, get out there and actually get the words out of it, but to actually feel nothing but compassion for what these people have put in motion for themselves through the choices that they had made that day. Uh, one of the things that I think is important from the Casey readings that adds some light uh, onto what Tully is saying above there is that there is so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us that it doesn't behoove any of us to think ill of another. So much bad in the best of us, so much good in the worst of us that it doesn't behoove any of us to speak ill of another. That it's not just a one-time quote from Casey. There are several different places in which he comes up with that very same statement. Uh, my best analogy for that is, you know, when they talk about icebergs floating in the ocean and you only see about 10% of it above the water, we don't have any idea what that 90% down below when we're looking at it, at each other in these physical bodies in three dimensions. Okay, so if we understand that and realize this is not the best lifetime. In fact, if you, re uh, if you know Casey's uh, past lives, he had one just before he was Edgar Casey, was a past life with the last name of Bainbridge. And he was psychic. And he used those psychic abilities to get over on women and win at gambling. You would have met the guy then, you go, what in the world? And you would have seen just that 10% of what he was dealing with in that particular lifetime and not understood the 90% underneath was not showing at that particular time. What is common in most failed relationships is an intensification of egoic wanting and needing. Playing the roles the other person wants is hard work and cannot be sustained indefinitely. This is especially true once they start living together. All right, so we're talking about how does this work when we are in a very personal relationship, a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with another person? Now, Casey is, interestingly enough, talks about we keep uh, meeting other people and we are drawn to them karmically. Now, there's a couple of reasons or why we are attracted to uh, people because you could have good lifetimes and not so good lifetimes with them in the past and you're just resonating to the good ones, right? You go, I remember that and we can do that again. Here's another interesting idea from the readings. It says, this other person comes out and you are attracted to the lesson that you need to learn. This person represents a lesson that you really need to have. And so that draws you to who they are and it gets you in a relationship. I think this probably answers a lot about like whirlwind romances where they just fall absolutely in love with each other and then you, a month later they go, what the heck happened? All right, you become drawn to the karmic lesson that you would learn by getting together with this individual. And once that lesson unfolds and you're going, what the heck happened? Then it becomes a little clearer as far as who you are and who they are. It doesn't make either one of you wrong, but it gives you a better idea of how to be able to explain or understand how you started out so well and things started to fall apart. And then it allows you to focus on the lesson that you were drawn to there. Because just because the relationship seems to be going sour all of a sudden doesn't mean it's not the perfect opportunity to be able to work through whatever drew you two together to begin with. The paradox of suffering is that it is caused by identification with form as it erodes identification with form. Eventually, suffering destroys the ego, but not until you've suffered enough consciously to give it up. Do we understand what that's saying? It's going, I hurt, but I do it again. And now I hurt more, and I do it again, and I hurt more. At a certain point, and we talk about this certainly in and uh, 12 steps and all that where it's a, a person has an addiction where they hit bottom and then they are able to go ahead. But you have to hit bottom in order to get there. Well, this is what Tolley's talking about. The paradox of suffering is that suffering is getting you further and further away from the mind of God 
But once you hit bottom, the paradox is, is that it's that suffering that actually gets you onto the right path, where you finally go, this is enough. Now, Casey has a very, very nice, sweet way of putting this. He says, for how long can we resist the unconditional love of our Creator? For how long can we resist the unconditional love of our Creator? And going, if all we keep getting met with from God, certainly we have to reap what we sow, and that causes the suffering, but there's endless patience, endless opportunities, endless lifetimes to be able to make better choices out there. How long is it going to take us until we don't take advantage of that endless help that is available to each and every one of us to be able to return to him as did the prodigal son. We are going to figure out that we need God in order to be able to help us live a better life. And suffering helps us to be able to get there. And if we can see it for that, then we don't hate suffering. We see it as it's an opportunity. I'm not enjoying it. It's not really making me happy right now. But what I am feeling pain with is telling me just like if I have an injury on my arm, that's where I need to focus. If I'm having pain in my life and health, if I'm having it in relationships, if I'm having it in prosperity, it tells me where I need to focus my attention and ask for God's help in order to be able to heal me. To create suffering without recognizing it, this is the essence of unconscious living. This is being totally in the grip of the ego. Cooperation is alien to the ego, except where there is a secondary motive. What, what does that mean? That second part, uh, the first one's not too hard to understand right there. You're going, you are just so tight. I mean, Earth is, and, and living in three dimensions is just giving you a left and a right and a left and a right, and one in the gut and left and right, and goes back to beating you up again, and you're just bouncing off the walls, <coughs> excuse me, reacting to everything that's happening to you. That's pretty easy to understand. Down here, cooperation is alien to the ego, except where there's a secondary motive. One of my favorite explanations of how you can have cooperation with a secondary motive is prohibition. Go back to, you know, the very early 1900s, and you wound up having the uh, interesting bedfellows between bootleggers and uh, Baptists. You wouldn't think those two would jump into bed very often, and certainly they don't, but why did the Baptists want prohibition? So people wouldn't drink the, uh, you know, the demon rum, right? Why did the bootleggers want it? So that nobody would be competition. And their goals actually worked together. Well, guess what? There was a third leg to this stool. It was called the politicians. They were getting lots of money from the bootleggers, and they were getting even money and votes from the Baptists that were out there, and they're going, well, that sounds good to me. Let's go ahead and make uh, prohibition uh, one of our constitutional amendments. It's really hard to make a constitutional amendment. Don't you have to get like two-thirds majority? Have we ever gotten two-thirds majority of anything out of Congress in the last hundred years? It's kind of hard to imagine that, all right? So they were able to do that back then with this, and yet it didn't even last 15 years before they repealed it. And you know what? The Baptists were saying this was a terrible idea. By the time they finally wound up repealing it, they're going, this was stupid. We created Al Capone. We created the Mafia. We created all this ugly stuff. People are still drinking. By the way, Casey actually responded to that. He said, is prohibition the right thing to do? Casey said, the country's already decided to drink. <laughs> <laughs> What, what you have to decide in prohibition is whether you want to make them criminals for it or not. <laughs> so, what a great, great line. So when you're looking at cooperation, is there a secondary motive? Yep, there can be. Looks like you're being cooperative. It's not. All right, cooperation is a whole different thing when you look at it like that. The energy field of old, but still very much alive emotion that lives in almost every human being is the pain body. I'm sure most of you who are totally readers of the past have gone, I haven't heard him say anything about the pain body yet. Because <laughs> that's a big concept with him. The pain body. It is not just individual in nature. It partakes of the pain suffered by countless humans throughout history. On some level, all seemingly individual pain bodies are connected. I'm going to talk about pain bodies from an Edgar Cayce reading standpoint as being karma. 
All right, we have our individual karmas that we come in to deal with in our lives. And then there's the karma that the family experiences. And then there's the karma that the community experiences. And then in the state and the nation and the global uh, manner of things. So, in other words, these shared karmic situations at all of those different levels are very much what he's talking about here in terms of the pain body. What, is, what are these karmic situations? What do we do at all of those given levels? Here's an example in the World Affairs readings from the Edgar Casey readings. Um, he actually went in and was giving what the sin of, of particular nations were. The United States sin was boastfulness. The sin of France was lust. <laughs> So you wind up, and, and he went. He gave about four or five uh, uh, different countries out there, and what? It, and Great Britain thought that they were just a little bit better than the next man. <laughs> it was interesting to have even the vocabulary. I, that's probably an exact quote, or close enough, to give you an idea that it was coming out even in the vocabulary of the people of that country when he was talking about these things. All right, but the pain body is individual and it is shared at all sorts of different levels. Just like, you know, we talk about the physical and the mental and the spiritual in the, in the Casey readings. He's talking about how we can have a shared pain body or shared memory that turns the shell even harder that makes up our egoic uh, personality. But let me, let me set it up a little bit first. One of the questions that comes up is, uh, and over and over again, it's that Casey says that we have always been and will always be. We souls have always been and will always be. Now, the interesting thing about that is Casey's also very clear that God created us. Anybody want to reconcile that for me? How could God create us and yet we have always been and will always be? We can understand that we'll always be because here we are and we live forever, everybody's got that one down. But how could we have always been if God created us? And this is, actually this doesn't necessarily come from the Edgar Casey readings, this came to me in a meditation when I asked that same question going, this doesn't work for me, can you clear this up for me? And I actually got this image from my uh, high school uh, life science class. This is a zygote dividing into two cells. That zygote is about to divide into four cells. And then eight, 16, you've seen it enough times in your own life science class, 32, 64, 128. And the thing stops where you just see all these little, you know, dots around the entire video right there of all these identical cells all sitting within the same zygote. Now, the best question that I had that got posed in my mind is, and let's just do it with the four of them. Which of those four cells is the oldest? There is no way to tell. If you have four identical cells right here, and they all started from the one zygote, couldn't it just as easily be that God is the zygote and he individualized each one of us in our consciousness and our free will out of who he is. All right, now, the idea that there was a clock on that is silly because there was no manifest universe at the time. So we always existed and moved and had our very being within the zygote of God and yet every single cell in there is the exact same age as the zygote. You with me? It's, uh, um, here you, you can say, uh, as above, so below. You've probably heard that before. It is actually a quote from a uh, historical, not the, not the Greek and Roman god Hermes, but a historical person named Hermes, who is actually a past incarnation, according to the Edgar Cayce readings of Jesus. So Hermes said, as above, so below. You know what else he said? On earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> it's just the inverse of the same thing, right? So that we're able to see life unfolding here on earth exactly as it does in heaven to be able to show that we have always been and, always been and will always be and are in fact still part in living and moving and having our very being within the mind of God. Christ can be seen as the archetypal human embodying both the pain and the possibility of transcendence. I, I love the way he said that, and it's, I can't believe how close that winds up being 
to Casey's definition of what Jesus was all about. Jesus was obviously, according to the Casey, uh, Casey readings, was the perfect role model for each and every one of us. He said, if you like what I'm doing, pick up your cross and follow me, right? He doesn't say, you have to live this way. He makes suggestions, and then you make your choice for or against as far as how that goes. And in fact, according to the uh, Casey readings, uh, Jesus had it as the soul, the soul name for Jesus is Amelius, and Amelius had 30 incarnations on the earth. The 30th being Jesus, who became the Christ, is the way it's, the way it's described in the Casey readings. And that last lifetime was when he absolutely did everything perfectly. Uh, I'll give you a, a few previous lifetimes that were of note, um, at least historically. Joseph in the coat of many colors. Uh, Joshua, as in the one that went in and kicked the heck out of uh, Jericho. <laughs> uh, it was Melchizedek. He was Enoch. He was Adam. And so if you were to take all of those particular lifetimes and say, what was, uh, you know, what was good, you know, and not so good about them, certainly as Joshua, there he is still being a very warlike individual. And, uh, and with uh, Enoch, I think it was Enoch walked with God. And so you, you start talking about he had lifetimes in which he was not born, that he literally translated into physical form instead of coming through the birth canal, or he translated out of physical form. But as Jesus, he came in through the birth canal like we all do, Died like we, well, let's hope we don't all die that way. But, <laughs> but physically, that there was a physical death of the body and proved that it can be resurrected when you do achieve, uh, achieve the Christ consciousness. And so when uh, Eckhart Tolle is talking about that Jesus is in fact the archetypal human that shows you how to be able to have the possibility, if you do what he does, of transcendence, we have a great deal of, uh, of agreement on both Tolle and Casey's readings. The pain body has its own primitive intelligence and is directed primarily towards survival. Any emotionally painful experience can be used as food by the pain body. The pain body is an addiction to unhappiness. Well, that's a you know, powerful paragraph right there. With the pain body, Really, there, I don't know if you know this, did you know that there are literally two metamorphoses that goes on with a caterpillar? Because it's born out of an egg. So the, you know, the uh, mother, if you will, lays an egg, and the egg itself has the little caterpillar emerge, and then it eats the eggshell because it's full of nutrients, and its first job is to go out there and wreak havoc on plants. You've probably seen that, right? Where little caterpillars go out there and just start eating the holes in the leaves and all that. And then they go ahead and attach themselves underneath, you know, like a well, twig or branch or whatever, and turns into a hardened shell of a chrysalis. And usually within about uh, 10 days to two weeks, that hardened chrysalis breaks open and the butterfly emerges out of there. Now, isn't it interesting that in that first, if you will, create, if we were all created perfect, and then when we emerge, we come out and start wreaking havoc on, you know, everything by eating up the plants and all that stuff. And then we go in, and when we shed the uh, chrysalis the second time, butterflies are just like bees in that when they go from flower to flower, they literally spread light through the pollination process. And so here we are. Let's say that we're in, uh, we're in between our, our best moments. We were, had that great moment where God created us perfect, and we're headed back to being butterflies through our own choices, but in between we've been eating a lot of plants and look like we got this big shell around us. So it, uh, the analogy works pretty well when you think about it in that case. But if the pain body is an addiction to unhappiness, you're going, how can you be addicted to unhappiness? Well, how does anybody wind up smoking? <laughs> You know, anybody that picked up a cigarette, inhaled that the first time, went, man, that's good. <laughs> Not a chance. You have to condition yourself, and you have a lot of, you know, reasons why you want to get there. Uh, you know, how, it, how wonderful it makes you look to be able to smoke cigarettes. I know it starts to sound dumb in this day and age, but certainly it was a whole different thing back when we were all growing up, right? So... Uh, and then Casey is, uh, you know, says that Jesus was sent to the earth to show us the way out. And without his perfect guidance and role model, we, could have, we would have been lost forever in the vicious cycle of being addicted to unhappiness. Because you think everything is, uh, you know, the, the um, 
answers that you make or, or, or that you come up with and, and have as a response to what the earth throws at you make perfect sense. And they don't if you are taking it from a spiritual point of view. So it wasn't until Jesus came to show us a better way that we were able to understand that there's a much better way to go about things. Once the unhappiness has taken you over, not only do you want it to continue, but you want to make others just as miserable as you are so that there are more negative emotions to feed upon. Up here when it's talking about the pain body uses this stuff as food. I mean... This is a scary image that, he, that he's drawing out here, but I don't feel like it's inaccurate. Sometimes people with such dense pain bodies become activists fighting for a cause. They may indeed be worthy, and they are sometimes successful at first in getting things done because of the energy they carry. But it is negative energy which cannot succeed in the long run. You know what, I, I could actually look at this and say this is somebody putting today's English to a Casey reading with all the syntax on there. I mean, it says it so closely there because the, uh, the Casey readings are adamant about our attitudes and emotions that, uh, that if you go from one extreme to the other, both wind up losing sight of trying to maintain a balance in all things. So you can wind up succeeding on a, uh, on a time and even a worthy cause. You know, I, I think uh, if you have like a mother whose uh, child, you know, died because of a football injury and they're, you know, going against football helmets or whatever the, you know, the, the issue is today. If you approach that because you are really angry at the system and you're angry at God and you've got all of these negative emotions built around what happened to her son right there, that energy can really get that thing pushed forward but it can't be sustained on that. Eventually, it has to go back to one of nurturing, encouragement, trying to find the best way to be able to do it instead of pounding my son's death into getting coercing people's behavior. You see what I'm getting at? If you don't back away from trying to just do this all the time and say, look, this is for the better or the greater good of all of us in order to be able to figure out safer ways for our kids to be able to participate in sports. You look at the present through the eyes of the emotional past within you. In other words, what you see and experience is not the event or situation, but in you. You become trapped in your own hell. To you, it is reality, and no other reality is possible. As far as you are concerned, your reaction is the only possible reaction. So the Edgar Casey reading suggests that until we can respond with that Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do and truly mean it. It's just what Tolly is saying up here, that we are trapped in our own self-made hell. And clearly most of us would have said something to, else to the Romans other than, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I know I would have. I, I, haven't, I haven't been working on that one too hard, but if I, <laughs> I'm sure I could come up with something than a less than loving response. Spiritual ideas and beliefs may, at best, be helpful pointers, but in themselves, they rarely have the power to dislodge the more firmly established core concepts of who you think you are, which are part of the conditioning of the human mind. I, you know, a good example of this is when I would talk to uh, traditional Christians. I, I spent years talking to all sorts of different atheists and all sorts of different religions online because you can reach out anywhere. You know, if you want to talk to a Muslim today, you can just get on there and go find them. Uh, on the internet, it's easy enough to do that. And the interesting thing about uh, traditional Christianity is that when I would talk to the, uh, to the traditional Christians, they literally think that you get this glorified body. To them, that's not you know, this consciousness that is able to exist without a form, they think that you're going to get this physical body that is eternal, that lasts forever, instead of winds up getting old and infirm and dies. And I'm going, really? You think you're going to be in this physical form for eternity? And that it has to eat and breathe air and, you know, all of it, the, and they're saying, well, yeah, and you can tell they're as perplexed with me as I am with them. In, in discussing all this. And then I said, but it says that we were created in God's image. I said, doesn't it make sense that we were created, 
you know, as pure consciousness as spirit. And they're going, what? And I said, to, be, to go in another direction, that would mean that you think God has arms and legs and a head. And they go, why would you think he doesn't? You, are, are you following this conversation? I, I mean, where I'm going with this? Because why would you think he doesn't? I'm going, well, first of all, nothing existed back then except for God. So why would God have arms and legs and a head if nothing else is out there? Wouldn't it just be pure consciousness? And they're, going, and they're shaking their heads at me going, God created us in his image and this is it. I go, okay. <laughs> we, we have no common ground to be able to go further with that. But I sure learned a lot when it came to all that. Uh, it, when it comes to the spiritual ideas that we can get from our religions, uh, you know, Casey warned, his own readings warned against making a religion out of the Casey readings themselves. Said uh, that such a church would become the laughing stock of the world. Not that it wouldn't be successful, but at some point down the road it would wind up being a laughing stock. Didn't go into details as to why that would be, but uh, it said there's actually the intent of the readings to be able to make you a better Baptist, a better Muslim, a better Jew, a better Hindu. In other words, it wasn't to create a new religion. It was to make sure that you, the religion that you resonate with is the one that you would become better by being able to apply the concepts in the Casey readings to the religion that already appealed to you. If the thought of lack, whether it be money, recognition, or love, has become part of who you think you are, you will always experience lack. Rather than acknowledge the good that is already in your life, all you see is lack. Casey actually called it economic healing. That was the term that happened back in the 30s when most of the readings that he gave on this kind of thinking was all about. And he said, you know, just like the um, parable that Jesus gave of the talents, you know, and the one that had the one talent, he went and buried it down in the ground and then he was really glad to be able to show, hey, I still got the talent after all that time. I didn't squander and waste it and blah, blah, blah. And, and the, said, fine, give that to me and I'll go give it to the guy, you know, who had five talents and turned it into ten. You're going, but I worked so hard to make sure that I didn't lose this. This is exactly the concept of what's being talked about right here. Because as soon as you think that you have lack in money, in recognition, in love, whatever it is, if you think that there's a lack there, then all that's going to happen is just like a slow leak in a tire. All right, it's going to continue to leak out, and it doesn't just mean that you're going to, you know, fall into ruin the next day, but you are on the slow track in the wrong direction. And as soon as you wind up seeing that you are a beloved child of God who absolutely deserves every good thing that happens to you, doesn't matter what you've done in the past, go forth and sin no more, and you have every good thing happen to you, and you're supposed to have it be that way for eternity, then everything is eventually going to work out to the greater good. So if we go ahead and follow uh, both Tully and, uh, and Casey's advice here, you're going to wind up being able to turn that around and no longer see lack. You'll see nothing but prosperity. You ever heard of Krishnamurti? And uh, he was one of the yogis that, uh, you know, was really good at being able to pontificate on Hindu perspective of life. Anyway, he suggested that his secret to great peace and happiness was that he didn't mind what happens, whatever that might be. He had become so attuned and had so much faith that all things work to good for those who love God that it didn't matter what happened to him if he met it with the correct ideal that it was going to turn out right. You know, there's a, a great uh, story about uh, an 87-year-old man who got, I, I don't know if he got hit or slipped or was trying to avoid a traffic accident, but he fell and broke his hip. And he ended up in the hospital. Did you hear this story? It was real recent. And, uh, and he winds up and he's in the hospital. He gets in the pool with the hospital staff for the lottery and they win. <laughs> so you're saying, I mean, it was, you know, it was certainly a million dollars or more. And so he's part of this whole thing. So as an 87-year-old guy, he's probably going, how awful is it that 
here I, you know, he's probably 87 and broke, and he goes, and here I am broke and all this terrible stuff, and I, now I, my hip's busted, and how am I going to pay for this, etc. And then he goes in and he's part of the pool that wins the lottery. So you have to look at this sort of thing from saying, whatever happens, whatever that might be, if you look at it and have perfect faith that God is literally, through the universal laws, guiding us in the direction that we need to go, it's really a wonderful thing. But you have to really be of a different frame of mind to have that much faith that we would be able to do it. Now, the, uh, actually, there was one thing that I had a, uh, a question come up when I was dis discussing a concept like this in the past, because I said, you know, we're never given more than we can bear. And said, I, you know, how do you wind up having people that commit suicide? I, don't you think that they had more than they could bear? I said, <laughs> okay, I really need to be specific here. Are we ever given more than we can bear? Universal law will not give you more than you can bear, but we have free will. And free will means that we can choose to take on more than we can bear. He said, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. So you wind up having free will, and it, whereas universal law would have given it to you in a few more drips and drabs, you get to drink from the fire hose. If you so choose to have it come to you that way. All right, so I, I had that question come up more recently. I said, you know, I really need to address that. So there it is. There are three ways in which the ego treats the present moment. As a means to an end, as an obstacle, or as an enemy. Your sense of self depends on the past for your identity. And the future for your fulfillment. So the present moment is, at best, a means to get you to the all-important, but never quite gets here, future. Our past has got us to a position that we're not necessarily happy with, and we have these plans that are going to take us to fulfillment in the future, but that never quite gets here. And why are we never quite fulfilled? Because when you are feeding the pain body, and it needs to have unhappiness because it's addicted to it, you always need to be in a state of want rather than have. Have is not really exciting to you. Want is much better because then you're unhappy. So that's describing the first part here. It goes on to say, when you hate the past that has led to the present moment, or in your inner dialogue consists of should and shouldn't complaints, then you have made the present moment an enemy. Always ask yourself, what is my relationship with the present moment? Is what we are living today the enemy? If we see it as that, you can start to see that things don't necessarily work to good in your life at that particular moment. We're still working through our, uh, our karma, if you will. Now, one of the things that comes up here is this concept, and Casey makes it very clear, that the ends never justify the means. How many movies, stories, books, all of that that, you, that we go into and are going, I have an impossible choice here, and this is going to be wrong, and that's going to be wrong, and I'm going to choose the path that, that at least winds up with the greatest outcome, no matter what wrong I have to do to get there. How many movies and, and books and stories have we heard that wind up going there? So the ends never justify the means. We probably are unwilling to go, okay, now the best path right here is that I sit in this garden until the Roman soldiers come grab me and humiliate me and torture me and finally kill me. That's the best answer I have. I don't think any of us are of a point where our minds were, would be able to go in a direction like that. But we cannot compromise our values and beliefs because we think that the indiscretion would be worth it in the end. This is going to continue in this next slide. Your inner purpose is to awaken. That is an essential part of the purpose of the whole. The universe and its emerging intelligence. Your outer purpose can change over time. Finding and living in alignment with your inner purpose is the foundation for fulfilling your outer purpose. That one took me a while to, to digest as I was going through it. You know, we, if we were created by uh, God as uh, God's divine children, and it's our destiny to be companions and co-creators with him throughout eternity, at least according to the Edgar Casey readings, we might call that 
and looking at it from this filter through Eckhart Tolle, we might call that our inner purpose. While the outer purpose is to patiently work with whatever we find at hand to manifest God's love in whatever we do. All right, so if we're looking at this in terms of your outer purpose can change over time. So when we have one lifetime to another, one job to another, one spouse to another, one, you know, one friendship to another, all of those things can wind up having what we do in the outer purpose and in our interactions with the universe, that changes over time. Okay, but what is the inner purpose? It's the essential part of the whole, the universe, and it's emergent intelligence. We are always trying to awaken who we are and always keep in mind that we are the divine children and siblings of a God of unconditional love. The ego will always try to add awakening and enlightenment to itself as its most prized possession. In so doing, the ego becomes bigger and is itself more important than such things. Isn't that true? If you wind up owning, you know, you feel like I own this thing. So therefore, I, you know, it's one of my trophies that I have out there. And if this is something that I own and control, then I must be even greater than what it is, right? So greatness is a mental abstraction and a favorite fantasy of the ego. The paradox is that the foundation for greatness is honoring the small things of the present moment instead of pursuing the idea of greatness. Now, the, uh, I think I, oh, of course, Casey uh, definitely quoted the Bible when he was talking about if you want to be the master, you know, if you want to be the Messiah, the master, the savior, you must be the servant of all as well. And that was at the Last Supper. You remember where he got down and he washed the, uh, the feet of the, of the uh, disciples. So if you think of all of the earthly rulers, not Jesus, but the earthly rulers throughout history, they paid an awful lot of attention to conquering the earth as well as all of their perceived enemies, right? So they're like, I'm going to beat them up and take them over and control this. But how much attention did they pay to the plight of their own people? That they had people within their own ranks that were hungry or those that were injured. And, you know, they went into war and they said, oh, sucks to be you. You got your arm cut off. I can't use you anymore. All right. But God knows the number of hairs on the head of each one of us. And he supplies every need that we have. The Bible tells us that as well in case he quotes it. So uh, such attention of the tiniest detail from our greatest servant, who would be Jesus slash God, is absolutely true greatness. All right, so when we're, we're talking about what is greatness here, greatness is when you take care of your neighbor, when you see that you, where you can be of service, and you take those small steps in order to be of service to other folks like that. Is greatness being able to say, I am ruler of the world? No, because then you're going to die, and then you're not. <laughs> so then it's all over, and it's, uh, you know, when you see, I, I love that buffer sticker, it says, he who dies with the most toys wins. You're going... Wins what? <laughs> you got nothing to show for it, but yet there it is. When you become comfortable with uncertainty, this is a great concept, comfortable with uncertainty, infinite possibilities open up in your life. Why? Because not being comfortable with uncertainty turns to worry, and that turns to fear. React to uncertainty with increased aliveness, alertness, and creativity, and create your own wonderful possibilities. That's, a, that's one of the most uplifting things I, I read in anything that Eckhart Tolle has written, at least that I read. Maybe he has other stuff out there. But I, I look at that and I'm going, that to me sounds like, you know, it's just, it's full of everything wonderful. Uh, going back to patience being the measurement of the, uh, well, actually, I didn't cover that yet, in which we have, uh, you know, we said patience is a great measure of our spiritual development. But Casey goes on to indicate that patience is the measurement of our understanding of a manifested idea. Go back to that Krishnamurti thing where he said that he doesn't mind what happens to him. Why? Because he has so much faith that everything's working to good. That it's going now you can do that through faith, but I think through great patience you actually intuitively begin to understand that when I broke my hip it's so I can win the lottery. 
I mean, it literally will get that clear to us with a greater clarity that we have using our intuition. So that's why the uh, Edgar Casey readings say that patience is the best measurement of our soul development because it opens us up to that. So you can, uh, um, you know, when you get to that point, this is one that it draws a lot of uh, concern from people, but Casey said that Jesus actually laughed and joked on his way to Mount Calvary. And he's sitting there carrying that cross up the road to Mount Calvary. He was literally joking and laughing with the crowd out there. And there were two reasons for it as far as what Casey brought up. He said, first of all, when he had that attitude of what he was going through, how do you think the Roman, he wasn't doing it to upset the Roman soldiers, he was doing it to let them know, you can do all of this to me and I am still in control of who I am and how I feel. The other one was to be the perfect role model to everyone else, letting them know that if you find yourself in a position like this, you too, if you have the Christ consciousness, will be able to be in total control of how you think and feel, no matter how bad it gets out there. All right, so I, what a great role model to be able to talk about how he was able to show that to us. The modalities of being awakened are acceptance, enjoyment, and enthusiasm. If you are not in one of those three states, look closely and you will find that you are creating suffering for yourself and others. I'm going to take a next slide covers this a little bit more. Acceptance, enjoyment, enthusiasm. Think about that for a minute. What does it mean to be in acceptance or your enjoyment or you're enthusiastic about it? They say that, uh, the Casey readings say that we should know and believe that God is forever on our side. The universe is friendly. And we should always strive to be content but not satisfied. That's a real important quote from the Casey readings. To be content but not satisfied. Why? If you're satisfied, don't you quit trying to get any better? Don't go for satisfaction because if you're there, you're going, I'm good where I am, and you've got all of eternity in front of you. So if we aren't content but not satisfied, we can be very happy with where we are and still be striving to do more and more and get better and better as we go along the way. So let's take a look at those three states. Acceptance requires me to do something even if form thinking would find doing that unpleasant, I do it willingly. So you always have things in life you're going, I'd really prefer to not do this. But we wind up doing it anyway in the acceptance of realizing that in the doing, I mean, who wants to, you know, wash the dishes and clean the bathroom? But you wind up accepting it going, just imagine if nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to the point where acceptance says, I not only do it, I do it willingly, recognizing that this is a better way of handling it. How about enjoyment? Enjoyment replaces wanting. Remember we keep talking about wanting and having as being parts of the, uh, the ego or the cycle of ego. Enjoyment replaces wanting. The waiting to start living syndrome is one of the most common delusions of the unconscious state. Anyone here heard of Terry Cole Whitaker? I, I, I love that woman. I, she was, uh, I think, wasn't she a minister out of San Diego or the Southern California area over there? And she had a quote one time that took me by surprise so much I just laughed out loud. I was watching her on TV one time and she said, this is the life you've been dying to have. So here we are, lifetime after lifetime of what we're talking about right here, waiting to start living. It's not just that we get to be 30, 40, 70, 80 years old and haven't started living the life that we wanted to right now. We actually go lifetime after lifetime after lifetime not living the life that we intend to have because we keep waiting for some particular thing to happen. All right, so we need to start enjoying what we have right here. So you can say, you know, life is a journey. We should be enjoying the journey as opposed to only thinking that the destination will bring us happiness. Enthusiasm is really an interesting one. Enthusiasm means there is deep enjoyment in what you do plus the added element of a goal or a vision that you work toward. The word enthusiasm comes from the ancient Greek, and I won't even try to say enthousiasm, and means to be possessed by a god. Enthusiasm is the power that transfers the mental blueprint into your physical dimension. 
So we're saying enthusiasm, it's, just, it's one thing you can go, okay, here's an architect with a, with a set of plans and a contractor actually makes the building out there. But just how much difference does it make when you have enthusiasm behind it? Did you ever see that movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yeah. And yeah, Ben Stein, that was the guy who's up there at age aging and anybody... Anybody, can I have the Aunt Bueller? <laughs> you just bore you to death if he's up there. But if you have enthusiasm, I, I, I used to not really like school at all. And I remember I went into a classroom one time for, it was U.S. history. I think it was a junior in high school. Went in there. That man loved history. I mean, he loved it so much he could breathe it. You could tell that everything that he talked about was just so important to him. And it started to become important to me for some reason. You know, I just, it was infectious the way he would just be up there. He'd be talking about those 55 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. And what a unique opportunity in time it was. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm not taking notes, but because I never did, <laughs> but I, I was fascinated by the enthusiasm that he had for the whole thing. And so you wind up bringing that enthusiasm that takes it from the mental dimension into the physical dimension, and those are the three forms. Acceptance, enjoyment, and enthusiasm are the positive ways to approach every single thing that we encounter in our lifetime. And uh, Casey has never said it with the kind of clarity that uh, the Tolly has right here, but very much agrees with it. This is the end. It is not uncommon for people to spend their whole life waiting to start living. I had uh, a couple of really good friends of mine, oh, this was probably 25 years ago now, and I'd grown up with one of them since I was eight years old. We were just sitting around in my living room one night, and, I, and uh, one of them asked, at what age did you peak? Was the wor wording that he had. At what age did you peak? When were you the happiest in your life? And uh, I looked at it and I said, today? You know, I, <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I couldn't understand the idea of peaking. Both of the, of the friends that I'd known for a long time, and one of them at that point, probably for 30 years, had felt like they had already hit the pinnacle of what their life was going to be and that it wasn't going to get any better from then. I'm going, oh my gosh, I, could, I don't even know how I could wake up in the morning if that's the way I felt. And then I started to understand how people start having these pain body experiences and what you were ad addicted to unhappiness because if that's all you've got left because you, you know, you have nothing to look forward to anymore. And so when I see a quote like this, that it's not uncommon for people to go through their whole lives waiting to start living, then I understand it at that point because it was with uh, very good friends of mine that I finally got that lesson taught to me. There can't possibly be any questions about all this. You know everything there is, <laughs> everything there is to know about Eckhart Tolle. 